this video is sponsored by Adam and Eve, a store that sells some more risque items for the mature ladies and gentlemen of this delightful planet. Use discount code RIGHT at the store checkout and receive 50% off one item and free shipping in the US and Canada. They have a 90-day no-hassle return policy and 24-7 customer service. So if that's your jam, then I would certainly recommend them. Let's get into the video. Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to The Right Opinion, the home of a twat with too much free time. And for those well accustomed to this channel, you'll know that I have a habit of covering topics that typically pertain to the YouTube sphere. I do this for a variety of reasons, it's consistent with my brand, you guys enjoy it, I have great personal investment in the subjects, and the views aren't too shabby either. All these factors are considered when taking on a new project, and as you can envision, my head runs a series of complex mathematical algorithms to calculate the most suitable themes to cover in my upcoming content. However, every now and then there is a disturbance in the matrix, the tro computer malfunctions, and a topic is chosen because I feel like it. Yes, I know, shocking as it may be, I do possess the ability to experience feelings. Today, this emotional intuition has led me to one of the most iconic talk show hosts of all time, and perhaps the not so unfamiliar fate that befell them this abysmal year. You see, as I've subtly alluded to just now, YouTubers have personas, myself included. Although these personas will seldom completely mirror the individual behind them, we tend to develop a more personal connection with them than we do with most celebrities because of the many personal elements that have been integrated. YouTube intimacy has always been a specific selling point, and where we may separate the art and the artist in various branches of entertainment, with content creators the relationship seems a little more inextricable. However, probably one of the most similar genres to that of YouTube is the American talk show Post. I will shut down Twitch, I will shut down YouTube gaming. I have that power. For years we have perceived them as an invasive species on the platform, and to be honest, I can't say I'm particularly enthusiastic about their presence. However, their involvement makes a lot of sense, especially given how they brand themselves. Hell, the overlap is so obvious now, we even have a YouTuber who became a talk show host. That's a video for another time. But for those who are familiar with this brand of TV personality, you'll know that in spite of the scripted sequences and the big name guests, there's a lot of weight in the actual host and the qualities they hold. Whether it's the suave suited sardonic bite of Vanilla, the recent incision of Stephen Colbert, or the James Corden. Each holds their own appeal. However, few can lay claim to the degree of market dominance that one woman has commanded. That woman being Oprah Winfrey. Right, this calls for a drum roll. Cue the drum roll. All right, open your boxes. Open your boxes. One, two, three. Ha <laughs> ha. Get baited, punks. Though completely true, of course, the Oprah Winfrey show has been off air for just shy of a decade now. However, it was over 20 years ago in 1997 when an individual by the name of Ellen DeGeneres appeared on Oprah's show to speak openly about her sexuality for the first time. Why did you think it was necessary for you to come out? You know, you've read some of the mail. People say, so if you're going to, why not just let that be your business? Why was it necessary for you to come out, tell the public? Why was it necessary for the character to do so? because it's okay. At that point, Ellen was a star of the popular sitcom Ellen fitting name. James was coming out was integrated into the plotline of that show as well, with the revelation occurring in a scene where Oprah played Ellen's therapist. The episode that contained the sequence became one of the most viewed in the show's history, attracting an audience of 42 million. However, in spite of this, reception was mixed from within the industry and political spectrum alike, with some advertisers pulling slots and pressure from family rights concern groups. How delightful. Although Ellen was renewed for a fifth season, Disney owned ABC ran parental advisory warnings before each episode, which along Alongside other factors was attributed as engineering the show's decline in ratings and eventual cancellation, stimulating debate over LGBT discrimination within the field. What about this was adult content? Depicting characters who are gay on television in uh, physical acts, I believe, is adult content. But how is that more adult content than? heterosexual couples rolling around in bed, which they do. Again, we're making a judgment about what our society is comfortable with and what they might not be comfortable with. Aren't we then just enabling a prejudice in the audience? 
We're not telling people necessarily not to watch it. Ellen's TV career encountered a bit of a rough patch over the following years, with another attempt at a sitcom, The Ellen Show, failing to find success. However, come 2003, the winds of change were finally blowing in the direction of our comedienne. Firstly, with the release of the animated film Finding Nemo, where she played a memorable character by the name of Dory, a fish with short-term memory loss. The distinctive voice performance won Ellen both praise and awards, fortifying her status as an innovative and versatile entertainer. However, the best was yet to come because in September, the first transmission of a little program known as The Ellen DeGeneres Show was broadcast. It's, uh, it's September 8th, this is our very, very first show, and you are my very first audience. The Ellen DeGeneres Show, commonly shortened to Ellen, is a daytime talk series, hosted by none other than our well-acquainted friend Ellen DeGeneres. Its philosophy is often portrayed as one of positivity, accented by a light-hearted tone, with audience and celebrity guest involvement in a variety of games, pranks, jokes and giveaways. Since its inception just over 17 years ago, Ellen's show has steadily ascended the daytime TV ratings hierarchy, often only being bested by the man Dr. Phil himself. The show has received 61 daytime Emmy Awards, spawned spin-off series such as Ellen Games of Games, and garnered the reputation as a space where one can turn themselves off from all the stress in the world, an asset that becomes ever more valuable in times like these. Nonetheless, it wouldn't be possible to convey that message if the host didn't encompass those same values. And in Ellen, many found someone who is a beacon in that darkness, a doctrine of kindness represented by a person who had faced hardships to be where they are today, but had come through and wanted to share that spirit with you. I don't think you have to have a talk show to, uh, to be nice to people, to, to do what I'm doing. Um, I just think that kindness is something that we should all have. That's an innate quality that we have and we need to, we need more of that out there. Be kind to one another. A simple but powerful precept and one that to many, Ellen appeared to live by herself. However, in a time where many felt that kindness was more imperative than ever, some began to claim that it had in fact deserted her, while others, well, asserted it was never even there in the first place. What followed was a media-propelled deluge of allegations that threatened to alter the perception of a beloved TV icon and everything that people thought she stood for. Conversely, many jumped to her defense, stating that these character attacks were unwarranted, that critics had imposed unfair standards, and that Ellen was still the person that she had always claimed to be. Was this a person under attack or a persona under the microscope? Well, there's only one way of attempting to find out. Ladies, gentlemen, Folks, I suggest we begin to unravel this curious, curious case. You see, what seems recent actually goes back a bit further than you may think. So to fully understand what we're dealing with today, we're going to dust off the Tro time machine, give it a spin, and gather some intel to grasp what laid the foundations for the coming charades. I've been studying kindness for the past 17 years on this show, and I thought I could help with some research that, that you know, like, I don't know, these are things that I've learned. So uh, consider me your professor. This is like Kindness 101, so pay attention. This is on the midterm. The Ellen DeGeneres show has, in a way, established Ellen as an icon unlike anything else she has created. This is not to diminish her contributions to her career prior. We should acknowledge that these things are cumulative. But when people think of Ellen, they think of this. All right. What I want everyone in this room to do is just think kind thoughts. Let's witness the power of kindness. Let's just think kind thoughts, everybody. In a way, that is incredible. And the fact that so many people have that innate association is a testament to her skills as a performer. Yet at the same time, given the marketing and framing of the program, a lot of viewers and even guests will receive the impression The Ellen DeGeneres Show is fundamentally what happens when you just take Ellen and stick her in front of the cameras for 40 minutes. In a way, this is part of the charm. At the same time, this is an unrealistic interpretation. Now, does this mean that Ellen isn't a kind or even good person? Not necessarily. Ellen preaches those virtues on and off the air. But at the same time, it's clear that some had a mental image of Ellen which didn't match their subsequent experience, particularly when the cameras weren't rolling. For gossip magazines, when someone expressed this sentiment publicly, it was indicative of the, quote, real Ellen, and had been the predominant point against her for a fair few years. In a way, I think that was the result of the fact that certain skeptics found Ellen's shtick too good to be true. And with the online world, when someone appears so wholesome and perfect, some people feel disposed to depose them. There were insider leaks and celebrities who had negative experiences with her, such as Kathy Griffin and Corinne Olympios, with the former describing her as having quite a mean streak and the latter referring to her on a podcast as very cold. 
Th would you say that's a great representation of yourself? Um, that is the real me. It is definitely a real side of me. Mm -hmm. um, but there are many other sides. Now, it's important to note that these were mostly fringe rumors at this point. Feuds and unfavorable interactions are not unexpected in the industry. Some outlets jumped on them because, as scoops, they are pretty interesting and challenge the universal outlook. But most people didn't pay them much regard. However, the fact that minor comments received this publicity was a sign that many were ready to have their expectations subverted. Hell, a 2017 YouTube video from Cavos on this matter has amassed over 10 million views, most of which came long before 2020. Go sit in that Ellen jail over there right now. <laughs> I mean, look how pissed Ellen is. Look at her face. I have never seen her act like this ever. It's fucking weird and all over a hat. And yes, people are laughing. Even Ellen's, you know, cracking a few laughs. But this lady has been shamed in front of 13 million people on YouTube, a live audience, and millions watching at home. And for what? Keep in mind that Cavos is a creator who primarily focuses on YouTube drama. And although his upload received mixed feedback on release, the traffic was indicative of the potential that such narratives harbored. That video focused on a rather peculiar clip in which Ellen roasts an audience member for taking more than one item from her merch stand against displayed instructions. Some of these more contentious clips have resurfaced over the years, attracting little slivers of public attention. These excerpts may have appeared well intended in concept, but could translate into practice as mean-spirited or blinkered. With that said, the video itself isn't anything extreme, and Cavos prefaces his critique with the acknowledgement that he actually likes Ellen. This is how many felt about her at the time, and it seemed that a lot of the criticism would amount to individual experiences of Ellen which didn't turn out as anticipated. This is the perspective that Ellen's wife Portia de Rossi echoed on an interview for Ellen's 2018 Netflix stand-up special Relatable, stating that she's just a bit more complicated than she appears on the show. There's more range of emotion. In the same article, a friend and director, Teague Nataro, affirms this, stating that being trapped in the world of being asked to dance and expected to be nice, it's real, and adding, I'm sure there's people who think she's kidding or can't have a bad day, but she does. It's an interesting pickle she's in. Ellen has bad days, and unfortunately, some people are going to see that from time to time, especially people who have had limited experience with her. Could such a point of view hold back public reproval? Perhaps, if each claim was treated as an outlier rather than a pattern. For a while, this was the case, mostly given the sparse and separate nature of previous negative testimonies and the existence of conflicting positive ones. It was particularly difficult to gather a consensus as to what Ellen's workplace was really like. The most openly critical testimony was provided by an individual by the name of Surgical Strikes, or Dan Tobin, which was posted in 2007 during the Writers Guild of America strike after Ellen questionably crossed the picket line to record her show. Tobin shared anecdotes from when he worked for her on the mostly unsuccessful sitcom The Ellen Show, which depict her as antagonistic and even derogatory towards her team. He remarks how she openly expressed the desire to sack the head writer for the lack of quality content, while noting how he would later go on to create the legendary Arrested Development. This post received ample amounts of media attention, but mostly faded when nobody else came forward to corroborate the claims. Ellen would go on to indirectly respond to this account and other headlines spurred by anonymous testimonies in the 2018 interview, where she dismissed them as quote-unquote an outright lie, emphasizing that workplace happiness is one of her utmost priorities. With that in mind, what reason did we have to doubt her commitment? Well, at the time of the interview, not much. I'm going to save some of the other contents for later, but as it stood, one thing that was constantly harped on was the fact that Ellen was human. In a way, I think many people knew that. Yet, even if we did, the Ellen DeGeneres show had almost elevated the image of its host in a way that was asking for it to be knocked down. However, the only way this was going to happen is if a consistent stream of people who had background with DeGeneres were to come forward. And for the longest time, that just didn't look like it was going to happen. Yet, here we are today. Which probably means one thing. It did. For the most part, Ellen's 2019 went off without a hitch. 
But as the new decade beckoned, she found herself in a bit of hot water after her appearance at a baseball game with former US President George W. Bush, where they seemed to be sharing some exquisite banter. Some online didn't welcome this interaction, given Bush's rather notorious legacy, which included the now highly contested invasion of Iraq. Ellen responded to this by appealing to her philosophy of kindness, stating that this principle doesn't just extend to people who agree with her. This was met with support from many celebrities in her comment section and also inspired a monologue on a subsequent episode. But just because I don't agree with someone on everything doesn't mean that I'm not going to be friends with them. When I say be kind to one another, I don't mean only the people that think the same way that you do. I mean be kind to everyone. Doesn't matter. Earlier in the year, she had received some mild criticism after hosting the comedian Kevin Hart. He had stood down from hosting the Oscars following the resurfacing of some older, rather inappropriate, homophobic content. Now, personally, if he's grown from that situation, then I don't think it should be held against him. And I do genuinely think that it's sad that he had to relinquish such a fantastic opportunity. At the same time, Ellen's narrative that the upset or outrage was merely a case of malicious internet trolls may strike some as a little offbeat. There are so many haters out there. Whatever's going on in the internet, don't pay attention to them. That's 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 a small group of people being very, very loud. We are a huge group of people who love you and want to see you host the Oscars. You know, the, the trolls are, and they, they do it, and who knows who this person is or, or people, who cares? And, and you can't let them destroy you, and they can't destroy you because you have too much talent. No one can do that. And for them to stop you from your dream, from what you wanted to do and what you have a right to do, what you should be doing, it's why they haven't found another now, this may not seem like the most relevant incident to today's discourse, and anyone familiar with Ellen will know that her friendship with Bush and Hart pre-existed these situations. However, it was an important reminder of the degree that our TV host Goodwill Incorporated. Whether it was too far for some people was unimportant. It wouldn't be Ellen if it was anything else. And you know what? Come 2020, we could all use a little bit of kindness towards one another. With the bleak socio-political landscape draining the very fibre of our being, it was never a better time for Ellen's teachings to shine through. However, rather than being the saving grace in a year full of letdowns, she became a key subject of the public's own disillusion. Let's move to March then, and if you recall, I mentioned that to garner publicity, claims would need to be organised in a way that outlines a pattern of behaviour rather than just individual experiences. It was hard to see exactly how that would happen, but gold was struck when comedian Kevin T. Porter decided to raise some money for charity through the rather unorthodox method of donating for every story shared about Ellen's cruelty. The tweet announcing this quickly received hundreds and eventually thousands of replies covering Ellen's alleged shenanigans. These ranged from former fans whose opinion of Ellen had been spoiled following encounters with the TV personality to eyewitness accounts of Ellen transforming into a dragon, though unfortunately there isn't any evidence to support that one. However, there were a few select claims that stood out and became rather popular on their own terms, one of which regarding Ellen's former head writer Karen Kilgrith. The tweet here asserted that during the 2007 writer's strike, Kilgrith had refused to cross the picket line and was subsequently dismissed from her role with Ellen never speaking to her again. Kilgrave had actually made a statement expressing empathy for DeGeneres at the time for crossing the picket line, so this would be a pretty damning story if true, and this is at least somewhat supported by Kilgrave's own retelling of the instance. You're in a position now where the show has decided to cross the picket line, and you said no. Well, I didn't say anything. I, mean, oh. I had to go on strike. <laughs> so yeah. it was just, we kind of all said goodbye, like, oh, this sucks. Well, this is so weird. See you later. And, you know, when I was talking to, like, my EPs were like, we'll call you. And it was all that kind of stuff. And I don't think anybody was prepared for the kind of political action that was about to take place. Like, I know no one knew what was going on. What happened? Well, the, the Writers Guild found out that they were the our show was going to cross the picket line. They went fucking berserk. They were just like they they wanted to like they made sure that I was always at the center of the like at the strike gate. It was really crazy. We just kind of became the eye of the storm in this weird way of like the show that's doing the worst thing because there were there were other. But you weren't working. No, right. we were striking. We so who, showed up who, every day. <laughs> like that was the crazy part. Is our show was mad at us because the guild was mad at them. What happened after that with with, with your relationship with her? Or, or, oh yeah, it was bad. So we got her to stay out the first day. Right. So Karen Anderson and I both were talking to her, and we were just like, "You please trust us. This is way worse than you think it is." Right. Um, and so she stayed out the first day. She told them, "I'm not going to cross the picket line," and then that's when they swarmed her. I mean, I don't the actually the affiliates. No, or no, no. WGA. The no, no, no. The 
production company, right, right. the people that ran the show, right. I'm sure her people, right. like all the big wigs went in and were just like, uh, no, you're doing the show. So she wasn't comfortable with it, but they basically convinced her, like, this is what you have to do. And then that's kind of when the whole, like, we are union zealots yeah. story started getting floated. And the next time after that that I Who, talked your writers? to her... Yeah, like all of us striking, which right. we had no fucking choice. She was definitely guilted of like, there's all these people that have jobs. You can't, you can't stop their paycheck. Right. You know, they put her in that weird position. The, I think the the part that fell apart the worst was just that interpersonal connection of like, you, nobody needed to be demonized. Nobody right. needed to be like, she's the one that's doing all this right. stuff. At one point, there was a story in the National Enquirer that I was in about how Ellen had crossed the picket line. There was like a picture of me on the strike line in the National Enquirer. It was the weirdest thing. And I never talked to anybody from the National Enquirer. That's not a thing you do. When you work on a show, you sign papers, it's yeah. confidentiality. Right. And there was no story to tell. We were on strike. It was just, it was what it was. And they, the people, the EPs and stuff found out and they thought I went to the press. So it was things like that where it's like, you've known me for five years and you think, you think I would go to the fucking National Enquirer to talk about this ridiculous situation. It was like, it was all that kind of stuff. By the time it was over, everyone was so estranged and everyone was so angry. And those people had to work for four months on a talk show with no writers. Like they must have been stressed out of their minds. I mean, it wasn't good. I honestly felt like at that time, it was almost like an act of God. It was like, I've been here for five years. I've given my all. This really weird thing has happened that would never happen in a million years. It's just like this strange right. thing. I'm out. Yeah. Like, this is my chance to go. And that's, and I just kind of washed my hands of it because it was just too, it was really painful. Now, does this excuse Ellen's actions? Not at all. It's a situation where she could have afforded to think for herself, and she didn't by the sound of it. The fact that someone sees contact with another individual altogether on the basis of a very difficult decision does make me wonder where her priorities lie. But it's not an indictment of character that we would need. However, we have plenty more stories to examine. Some of these characterize her as excruciatingly petty, complaining over trivialities and going as far to encourage the redundancy of those who had caused her inconveniences. Others depict her as cold, distant, and even cruel, with statements from multiple people claiming to be or at least no employees on the show, with the common theme being that many were discouraged from even conversing with her, with Ellen abiding by this principle pretty strictly as well. The stories just kept piling up, many of which not the most positive. Not that you'd expect it in a thread constructed on the premise of sharing your worst Ellen experiences. Additionally, the fact that exposing bad stories aids the support of a good cause may lead some to present circumstances in a more negative light than they actually occurred. Nonetheless, a good portion of these stories were hard to write off. Some came with receipts, and others came from seemingly credible sources. However, they were all united by one thing that the Ellen DeGeneres trademarked kindness was not as all-inclusive as proclaimed. In fact, to many, it appeared to be a source of personal profit, a facade that was dropped as soon as there was nothing at stake. However, as most of these tales hinged on third-party or anecdotal evidence, very little could prospectively come from it. A bunch of people gossiping on Twitter isn't really enough to topple an established TV personality alone. Nonetheless, social media can be an excellent gauge of how much meat is on the bone for a ravenous news outlet, and I'm sure many became excited at the possibility of a headline which revealed the undermining of personally promoted values by an otherwise revered public figure. Even if she didn't notice this, Ellen's producers should have recognized the warning signs and trod carefully on the eggshells before them. With the incoming threat of COVID-19, the standards and conduct of all involved would be put to the test more than ever. This was a time where kindness and care to those around you was desperately needed, perhaps even to an unprecedented degree in the Ellen DeGeneres' show's lifespan. And if they put a single foot wrong, they could easily be subject to some very sharp scrutiny, which could permanently damage the image of a show that they love so much and their precious, precious host. The truth is that if Ellen couldn't afford the currency of kindness to those around her, then it wasn't a price that anyone else was prepared to pay. Jesus, where the hell am I?
At the end of the previous part, I emphasized the significance of this viral threat. It had already spawned a few articles and sent a lot of previously unsuspecting eyes onto our daytime sweetheart. As the pandemic loomed and we were all advised to stay the hell away from each other, there were a lot of question marks over the entertainment industry and what this meant for shows like Ellen, which relied on the personal interaction with a live audience, as well as all the employees whose jobs may be on the line. At the same time, this concern went beyond the industry. It was likely felt by many people who watched Ellen and looked to her for guidance. It was an emotional time for many and Ellen needed to be sensitive to that. How would she deal with this age of uncertainty? I've always wanted to uh, to have this show as a, as a distraction, as a break from whatever is going on out there that may be unpleasant. So if you're feeling down, I want to lift you up. If you're feeling trapped, I want to set you free. If you feel like you're going in the wrong direction, I want you to back that thing up. A reassuring clip from home. The quintessential Ellen. What could possibly go wrong? One thing that I've learned from being in quarantine is that people, uh, this, this is like being in jail is what it is. It's uh, mostly because I've been wearing the same clothes for 10 days and everyone in here is gay. <laughs> the jokes that I have. Well, it seems the writers have gone on strike again because that joke kind of sucked. And it didn't go down particularly well with viewers either, with many tweeting out their dismay at various aspects of the joke. Now, there are many angles you can gird it from. However, I think once again, it just makes Ellen seem a bit out of touch with the state of the world. The analogy doesn't really make much sense on concept and its shortcomings are only intensified by the focus on Ellen's woes, which don't draw the most personal sympathy. You know what movie wouldn't have worked during a quarantine? Home Alone. <laughs> You're killing it today, Ellen. Now, with that said, it's a bad joke. It happens. At a time like this, it seems excessive to be angry. Who knows the stress that Ellen or her staff may be under that clouded their judgment on the delivery of such a gag. She would have to do a little worse than that to come under fire, wouldn't she? Well, a week later, it was reported that many crew members of the Ellen DeGeneres show were frustrated at their treatment following the state of crisis. As leaked by two anonymous sources, they had been given little to no communication and shown no concern by the show's executives. Further to this, many were frustrated that the show had hired an outside, non-union tech company to record her home broadcast. When employees did finally receive a response from producers over two weeks later, they were informed that their pay would be reduced by 60% to an amount that would be hardly sufficient for many workers. Much of the workforce probably felt their future was up in the air, and the alleged ambiguous messaging from leadership likely didn't assuage these anxieties. To wait for such difficult news can hardly be fair, and many were quick to point this out. Provided this is true, can this be directly attributed to Ellen? Not entirely. She can't be expected to keep in touch with everyone who is working for her. I think that a majority of people can understand that. However, the problem that once more rears its ugly head is that contradiction. The people who have given their all to keep a show running deserve to be kept in the loop above anyone else. And whether that's Ellen's direct responsibility or not, people don't want to see her as being in a system that is antithetical to what she advocates for. With this story, a new narrative began to emerge, one that didn't just accuse Ellen of hypocrisy on the basis of her principles, but of a greater double standard. When dealing with fellow celebrities, Ellen made the most heartfelt appeals to the qualities of sympathy and decency. After all, they are human like the rest of us. However, these standards appeared to be neglected when dealing with anyone outside the celebrity clique. Some felt this way following the George W. Bush controversy, that there had always been this separate class of elite above the consequences of their own actions, and that Ellen had since joined them. The contrast of a multi-millionaire in their mansion grumbling about lockdown while many employees' livelihoods were in jeopardy was not a flattering portrait and only served to highlight the us and them contrast. Um, I wanted to start doing my uh, new show as soon as possible because um, it's really for people who are stuck at home and especially my staff and crew. I love them. I miss them. And the best thing I can do to support them is to keep the show on the air. So... Here we are. However, this still wasn't the whole story, as clips began to surface which even threw the idea of Ellen's preferential treatment of celebrities into contention. These could be quotes from people reflecting on their experience, such as Nikki's tutorials, who decide to address the show's hospitality on a Dutch talk show. Who was it about Ellen DeGeneres? Um... <laughs> Ik zeg dat er een groot verschil is tussen uh, de wereld draait door en Ellen. <laughs> en dan uh, geef ik jullie het positieve handje. Want? Oh, punt. Nou. <laughs> nou, dat wil ik meer weten. Ja, ja, er zijn bepaalde... Kijk, bijvoorbeeld, het is wel heel leuk dat jij wel vooraf hallo komt zeggen en zo. 
Het is bij Ellen in ieder geval, is, wat ik heb meegemaakt hier en in andere landen, is dat gewoon een hele andere wereld. Het zit gewoon iets anders. Afstandelijke killer. Uh... Tikje. <laughs> it seems there's even a hierarchy within the industry, and despite being applauded on air, her treatment elsewhere seemed less than stellar. But that's just an account. What about direct clips? Well, there were those as well. It's good to see you. Happy it's belated birthday. birthday. When was your birthday? It was October 4th. October 4th. This is Dakota Johnson. She is an actress, model, and friend of Ellen. At the start of the interview, DeGeneres decides to jokingly take a jab at the fact that Johnson hadn't invited our gracious host to a birthday party. However, there was a small hitch with that. <laughs> Actually, no, that's not the truth, Ellen. You were invited. Last year, no, last time I was on the show, last year, you gave me a bunch about not inviting you, but I didn't even know you wanted to be invited. Yeah. But I did invite you and you didn't come, so. This time you invited me? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. How do you know? I don't think so. Ask everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Ask Jonathan, your producer. Who okay. said you were? I yeah, was invited? Right Why didn't I go? I don't know. Was it, was it? it oh yeah, I had that thing. Uh, In fact, at the time of Dakota's due, Ellen was occupied at a little baseball match with former President George W. Bush. Now, this exchange appeared to be in good humor. However, the circumstances surrounding it prompted many to return to it, especially with relevance to how disconnected Ellen is portrayed to be. Other clips were even more incriminating, such as a now rather infamous scene with Mariah Carey, where to ascertain whether she's pregnant with a child, Ellen decides to offer the singer an alcoholic beverage, something that anyone expecting a child would wish to avoid. I'll also add for further context that Carey suffered a miscarriage following this interview, which really does not age it well at all. And then the other thing is that people are saying that uh, that you're pregnant. There, there's rumors. Don't discuss that. Um, all right. Well, you don't have to. No, end. that's okay. No, no honestly, you don't have to. Right, end. Right. Let's just toast with champagne and decide. But they've if, been uh, saying that since we. Oh, uh, I can have a, uh, some champagne. It's it's just fattening. No, let's toast to you not being pregnant. If you're not pregnant, then oh, we should. My Yeah. You can and really... for both of our futures, who knows what they hold? Who knows? <laughs> All right, go ahead. Okay, cheers. Yeah, cheers. It's too early for me. Yeah. I only drink it after 3 p.m. Yeah. Mm. You're a <laughs> As a concept for a lowbrow gag, it may have been mildly amusing, and at first I actually thought it was far too personal to not be staged. However, Carrie would later go on to say that the interrogation made her rather uncomfortable, and when you take this into account, it's hard to look upon Ellen favorably. Even if this wasn't her idea, she should have recognized and respected the discretion of her guest, and not fallen foul to such tabloid treachery. I have my own dog. Actually, she's pregnant. Two, I have two dogs, both well, her master wrestles. isn't. Her master, well, let me take some of the vodka next to me. Why don't you answer? Ellen did that to me and tried to put me on okay. the spot All right. All right. with some alcohol. Okay. Like I'm not real trying alcohol. To put, I'm trying to put you on the spot. I mean, it's I'm, nice if you are. Her. Okay. <laughs> As these clips began to be collated outside the other documented claims, some began to search for an explanation for such conduct. Was she out of touch or out of care? Well, with more allegations to come, let's talk about it. With the gradually mounting agglomeration of content, there was little doubt that something here was not quite right. However, at the same time, there was a divergence in the theories that many adopted when attempting to assess Ellen's actions. On one hand, some believed that much of this illustrated a celebrity who had simply forgotten what it was like to live in the real world, and thus had become insensitive to the needs of many of those she claimed to care about. To be honest, many of the rich and famous likely suffer from a lack of relatability. However, their careers don't rely on connecting to an audience in the same way that Ellen's does. Are you fans of the show, correct? Yeah. And you watch the show regularly? All right. Great. One of those who subscribed to this school of thought was a former producer from The Ellen DeGeneres Show. 
Speaking anonymously in an article published in the New York Post, they recounted the time Ellen couldn't read a text after losing her glasses and decided that the reasonable response would be to phone Steve Jobs up and inform him that the iPhone should have a bigger font. They say that's Ellen and that she's not some demon, just a person who's been living in a privileged bubble for way too long. This doesn't seem like an absurd point of view and would perhaps explain some of these supposed rather petty behaviors as claimed by others. In focusing on her role as a host, Ellen may have been isolated from many that she works with, either by her own decision or through corporate design, something that I'll probably talk about in due course. Some who had worked with Ellen previously stating they had an overall positive experience, such as the former head writer Karen Kilgriff, appeared to have their relationship cut short pretty abruptly when a conflict of interest arose. In Karen's interest, she was clearly hesitant to characterize Ellen as the source of this falling out, especially with the attested corporate meddling. However, others would not be as charitable and have a more damning verdict on our celebutant chum. Where some may stop short of characterizing our leading lady as malicious, others would venture with far less trepidation, particularly with some of the more incriminating testimonies and clips on display. And then you had a very tough time. You couldn't get a job. What was that like? Not only couldn't get a job, couldn't get someone to on a phone. I mean, they're literally, you know, the show was canceled and no one called me. It was just, I found out, my assistant read it in the paper. Um, and, you know, I felt sorry for myself. I felt like this isn't fair. I thought people liked me, and why did this change anything? And I still am the same person, and, you know, every, everything felt horrible to me. Ellen is a TV veteran and someone who has had more than ample experience with the worst of the industry. However, although that makes her ascension of the hierarchy highly respectable, it also makes the selective application and even outright neglect of certain responsibilities harder to defend. With some personages, you can use ignorance as a way to explain certain blunders. Even if you personally believe they have a duty to be aware of the consequences their actions have, it may make sense that they lose sight of this. With Ellen, simply put, it seemed much harder to believe, with many coming to the conclusion that she must have been aware of these injustices, but had made the conscious decision to not care. Some would go further than this, though, to say that she may even take pleasure in the subjugation of those around her, partaking in excessively cruel and sadistic behavior. This falls in line with many of the more unforgiving stories regarding her conduct, and is not to be discounted either. Another person who would come out to support this in the month following was a bodyguard who escorted Ellen at the 2014 Academy Awards. He stated that although his experience with Ellen's wife Portia was rather positive, this went downhill quickly when he met Ellen, who barely even made eye contact with him, and radiated this aura of frigidity that bothered the chaperone in question. He summarizes his thoughts by saying that it's kind of demeaning in the way that she treats people other than those who are in her circle. Now, both of these aforementioned positions have their advocates and cases which seem to argue against, even people who claim that a lot of what was being said was completely fabricated. However, this criticism was not relenting, with many more people jumping in to discuss their brushes with the embattled icon. Yet in spite of this, all remain mostly quiet on Ellen's social medias. Addressing drama is normally not a positive process, whether it's the right thing to do or not, so she kept pushing on. But insider reports kept spilling that these allegations had affected her, and it was hard to deny that she must be somewhat aware of what was being said. Now, generally, the rule for a lot of public figures is to avoid punching down onto claims that may not necessarily have the substantiation to merit a response. However, with leaks and rumors reaching fever pitch, it felt like the program was a breaking point. Murmurings were being constantly released to the press who promoted it to the awaiting public in a vicious cycle that was gradually eroding away at the show and its host stature. At the start of July, the word began to spread that the Ellen DeGeneres show may be cancelled altogether because of the imputations. And although the production company behind Ellen dismissed this as speculation, unsurprisingly so, with what happened in the coming weeks, they may have wished they had. Because on Thursday the 16th of July, a damning dossier was published, which called out the toxic workplace environment behind the award-winning production. It outlined unfair dismissals, discrimination, favoritism, and neglect of responsibilities typically expected of a show with such moral grounding. Yes, one current and 10 former employees painted the workplace culture as one ruled by fear, with most of the blame being placed at the door of the producers, who had distanced DeGeneres and validated an environment that marginalized vulnerable individuals who needed support above anything else. 
In some ways, a lot of what was detailed wasn't any more incriminating than previous testimonies published. And this was much less focused on Ellen. But for some reason, this article cut deeper. Maybe it was the cumulative factor alongside other content. Maybe it was these socially charged narratives that had become ever more relevant in recent months. But for me, once more, it was the organization of a slew of stirring stories, posted in a credible, well, moderately credible news outlet. In the article, the executive producers who are the subject of a lot of the criticism express shock at the allegations, pledging their commitment to a safe and friendly workspace for all. They seek to accept full culpability for the misconduct listed, attempting to take attention away from Ellen. In many ways, this wasn't her story. But once more, at the start of the article, there was this emphasis on Ellen's narrative of being kind, effectively being used to contrast with the coming content. This wasn't just any workplace, this was Ellen's workplace, and if she was as kind as she was perceived, silence was no longer an option. Yet speaking out was a costly obligation all the same. Allow me to explain. Let's pull it back to Ellen as a person and Ellen as a show. In many ways, they are separate entities, but the fact that the latter is built on the former means that no matter what the producers asserted, this was as much Ellen's problem as it was anyone else's. As one of these staff members said, if she wants to have her own show and have her name on the show title, she needs to be more involved to see what's going on. One of the greatest problems with this industry is that there's often this separation between individual hosts and the productions behind them. That seems easy to forget as an audience member. But it is understandable when the host has a more passive role such as in certain reality programs or televised talent contests. And even then, in many ways, as an anchor to the experience, a presenter can't expect to be focused on controlling every aspect behind the scenes. However, this was reaching a point where Ellen's neutrality would be seen as a tasked endorsement of an undesirable status quo. The allegations were well-founded, and so she needed to say something. Before she could say anything though, Warner Bros stepped in to launch their own exhaustive internal investigation, which would determine the source of the problem. On July 27th, Variety reported that a memo had been sent out to staff members the week before, announcing the upcoming audit. With the consultation of a third-party organization and an employee relations group, interviews were held and circumstances were assessed, and three days after the initial story was published, Warner Bros released a statement on the findings of their assessment, revealing, quote, deficiencies in the workplace environment, while also signifying that changes would be made. This was a statement made both on behalf of the company and DeGeneres, which probably wasn't the best call. But it seems that Ellen had distributed her own separate statement to the staff, where she communicated remorse for her failure to stay conscious to oversights and shortcomings, vowing to make sure that a repeat of such antics would be avoided at all costs. This statement was once more picked up by the press, who framed it as Ellen finally breaking her silence. However, it was mostly an internal acknowledgement of failings only provoked by the report prior, and doesn't really mention much else. Not that you'd expect it to, but it's hardly what some online represented it as. Nonetheless, Ellen's statement was enough to begin a strange chain reaction that would take this ongoing controversy to new heights. You see, although the promise of a more secure work environment may have appeased some employees, those not directly affected appeared reluctant to accept her apology, likely because many felt that her anger was mostly adopted for the sake of damage control rather than actual regret. As a response to these specific accusations leveled against her, many felt this merely added further weight to the belief that she was just another self-interested social vulture. And this time, it wasn't just the internet rebel who were paying attention. In fact, Ellen's statement attracted the eyes of some pretty notable figures. One of those who left his input very shortly after the coverage by journalists was the esteemed voice actor Brad Garrett, who had appeared on Ellen's show during the 2000s. However, it appears that any camaraderie had since faded as he laid into the talk show host pretty harshly, commenting in a now-deleted tweet that it was, quote, common knowledge that Ellen had mistreated her staff, while also claiming to know a few personally. This was then reported on by websites, one article prompting a reply from Back to the Future star Leia Thompson, appearing to affirm Garrett's postulations with her best Yoda impression. Around the same time, Australian radio host Neil Breen, no, not that Neil Breen, recollected the time he had worked as a producer on a show that interviewed Ellen. The numerous restrictions that the production team had imposed on them and the subsequent atmosphere that yielded. Well, when Ellen DeGeneres came to Australia to do her show in 2013, I was the executive producer of the Today Show. So we partnered with them. That She was brought out here by Swiss, the vitamin company who was sponsoring the whole thing. And originally she was going to co-host the Today Show. Then she was going to do this. Then she was going to do it. And the whole thing got watered down to Ellen DeGeneres would do a sit-down interview 
right? We took the whole Today Show to Melbourne at our expense, but she would do a sit-down interview with Richard Wilkins. Um, we walk in, and then the Ellen Show, produ- there was a lot of them. Oh, there was a lot of people there. Anyway, the producers called us aside and said, okay, this is how it's going to work here this morning. Um, Ellen's going to arrive at, you know, 10.15, and she'll be sitting in this chair here, and Richard, you'll be sitting in this chair here. Um, now, uh, Neil, no one's to talk to Ellen. So you don't talk to her, you don't approach her, you don't look at her. She'll come in, she'll sit down, she'll talk to Richard. Then Ellen will leave and we'll give you the thing. And and I sort of said, are you fair dinkum? Oh, I can't look at her. I found the whole thing bizarre. Anyway, I've got to tell I'm not blaming Ellen because I didn't get to talk to her because I wasn't allowed to. So I don't know whether she's a nice person or not. I wouldn't have a clue. But I can tell you the people who worked with her worked walked on eggshells the whole time and the whole thing was totally bizarre. Like, we're there to do an interview with her to promote what she's doing, but you can't look at her? Like, someone get real. In case it couldn't get any worse, around the time she was being publicly chastised, further allegations were made towards producers regarding inappropriate advances, actions and comments towards employees, which included the invitation to provide one of our venerated executives with a hand job and even the occasional grope here and there. The main recipient of these allegations was producer Kevin Lemon, who many said veiled his conduct in sarcasm, yet carried it out in the most predatory fashion. There were also allegations which covered two other producers, Jonathan Norman and Ed Glavin. This was corroborated by many other former employees and seemed to incriminate other producers who didn't take action against such behavior. DeGeneres' own role is not explicitly spoken about, but as with previous incidents, it brings her position into question, as a person whose environment should reflect her own values. With these further contributions, it seemed that Ellen's reputation was practically in the gutter, and with ratings in freefall being at least partly attributed to the ongoing outcry, reprise to be a distant dream. You can't exactly be surprised though, after all, whether Ellen was an actively malicious actor or a distant celebrity no longer close to the inner workings of their own product, it was undermining her own appeal. And as it stood, these were the only two explanations that made sense of the situation, and neither made her look good. However, as the walls were caving in, it seemed that Ellen may have one last shot at redemption, coming from those most familiar with her, fellow celebrities, who wanted to present a third perspective one much more sympathetic. We're back with Katy Perry, and uh, you're about to go on tour, and uh, right. you are- September. You are single. And ready to mingle. Ready? From the initial post by Kevin T. Porter, there had always been those who had spoken up for our besieged heroine, telling of the genuinely positive experiences with her. And although it obviously doesn't represent a universal outlook, the fact that a fair few of these testimonies were going against the Twitter grain made them seem more authentic in a way. However, they had mostly been isolated and dismissed given their relatively faint presence in a sea of criticism. With August, however, this was about to change. As many had shared their negative experiences, public figures came out in droves to share their positive ones. Music producers, award-winning actors, comedians, and many more. Their stories told a different narrative. Sure, there may be rumors circulating, but the experience they had with Ellen was invaluable, and she has done so many fantastic things for so many people. She may not be perfect, but surely, whatever she was enduring right now wasn't fair. She had brought much more light to this world than many others, and to oust on the back of hearsay? Well, that's just ludicrous. The internet is a place full of negativity and stigmatization, and in a year like this, it was time to take a step back and remember what people like Ellen really gave us. A heartwarming sentiment for sure, but was it enough to dig Ellen out of the hole she had found herself in? Well, let's talk about it. With the attestations coming from many household names, this third narrative began to gather steam. There were so many people paying tribute to Ellen's character, many of whom would have significant personal background with her. Maybe online toxicity had overcome us, and it was time to look at the bigger picture. Some clearly agreed with this and echoed the sentiment on their timeline. After all, Ellen had done much more for communities than many of those internet dwellers throwing second-hand shade. However, at the same time, the celebrity narrative didn't exonerate Ellen in the way that one may have hoped. In fact, for some, it actually solidified more cynical theories relating to her demeanor. Why is that? Well, let's think back to the initial instance and what many alleged they told us. For 
many, it felt like Ellen provided preferential treatment to those in her elite circles and had a tendency to shun those outside of that. Therefore, it was completely plausible that those most likely to vouch for her were those in the elite circle. Now, with that in mind, there are plenty of appeals to the greater positive effect that Ellen has generated beyond those who have direct experience with her, given her records in fighting for human rights, animal rights, and many more. This is all well and good, but it doesn't really dispel the main point against the TV personality. From a social perspective, Ellen may have left a net positive impact on the world around her. I'm sure there are many people that her feel-good spirit has touched and inspired on a day-to-day -day basis. Equally, I'm sure there are many people who have been aided by a charitable ventures and philanthropy. But the moment that we let someone's net positive impact absolve them of all possible criticism is the time when our fundamental ability to think critically has failed. Sure, there may be some points where appealing to a greater impact as a public figure is a valid response, but responding to people sharing negative experiences and in indictments of workplace toxicity doesn't fulfill this criteria. A lot of these statements just feel like Ellen messaged the celebrity Twitter group chat asking people to vouch for her, because it doesn't seem like any of these people actually have a clue who they're responding to or what's even happening. And the fact that these posts were made a few days after the further impropriety allegations just makes them seem even more clueless. At the end of the day, I'm sure we're all happy that people had a positive experience with someone who they greatly admired, but this didn't alter what was happening elsewhere and how many wanted more than just people saying, she's nice, trust me. This sense of divide wasn't aided when former Ellen DJ Tony Okamboa commented that he personally stood with his fellow colleagues and had also experienced some of the reported toxicity in his decades shy stint on the show. There was one glimpse of hope for Ellen on a more personal basis though, as Samantha Ronson, a person who has worked with Ellen on more than on a few occasions, came out in support of the Under Fire TV host, saying that her experiences as an employee have been positive, creating at least some diversity from outside the celebrity clique. The current DJ Stephen Boss or Twitch had left a mostly ambiguous comment to the media, observing that in spite of the difficulties there was love. However, that love was clearly not present with three of the producers, who in the next week were all fired by Warner Bros. These individuals have been placed under the microscope following the allegations we discussed previously, and it's clear that the parent company had viewed these allegations with the gravitas that they warranted, or at least their media implications warranted. Two of the three producers had pleaded their innocence previously, denying the claims made against them, and as this was an internal investigation, it's hard to really comment on the reliability of what was being testified, though given the volume of the claims, it is hard to dismiss. Now with that said, I think their fates were sealed regardless. The whirlwind of media chaos whipped up had already given the corporate bigwigs a headache that was likely shortening their patience with the show's production team, and to keep on the producers after such widely endorsed claims had surfaced would have been bad news for them in more ways than one. At the end of the day, they can be replaced with people who will hopefully land the corporation in less hot water. The truth is, there's only one person behind the show who's ostensibly indispensable, and that's Ellen. Therefore, the priority will be to keep her image as clean as possible at all costs. Now, they had mostly failed in this task in the months preceding. However, there wasn't much they could do. The only person who can defend Ellen was Ellen. But at the same time, by doing so, she'd be opening up a can of worms. Unfortunately, the worms escaped regardless and had a lot of dirt. The celebrity support should have at least provided her with some form of consolation. But in fact, it partially played into the aspersions espoused by her detractors. It brought more attention to an unresolved issue which the company took seriously enough to sack three of their executive staff members, and a load of rich people dismissing much of the online outrage as people spreading rumors was incredibly ill-timed, particularly given the eventual outcome of the investigation. Once the departure of their senior level staff was announced, Ellen went on a call to discuss it further with present employees, where she is alleged to have contested certain claims about her character, such as those that asserted she didn't want people people to make eye contact with her, an assertion that she branded as false. As well as this, she had reaffirmed her commitment to being much more active behind the scenes and not just being an on-screen persona, which is good. However, as she had likely realized now, this wasn't just about her employees. This was a public issue where the inner workings of an otherwise beloved daytime program had been exposed, and she had to be the one to put it right. In many ways, the sympathetic explanation of this predicament that we discussed at the start of this part was still not out of the question, but some judgments can't come from third-party testimony alone. Anyone can vouch for another person, but sometimes that person has to speak for themselves and let people judge them on the basis of their own sincerity. 
This wasn't a situation where lawyers, producers, managers or celebrities could speak on Ellen's behalf. This was a wrong that she had to right. Ellen built a career on the back of kindness, a sentiment that when fabricated, people do not take lightly. The question was whether Ellen was a woman of her word. And at this point, we didn't even know what her word was. Now, when I spoke about the record low ratings on the Ellen DeGeneres show being partially attributed to the controversy, you may wonder what the other reasons were. Well, simply put, they were reruns, and reruns will inevitably draw less viewers as some have already watched the episodes being aired. Nonetheless, a new season was around the corner, and that meant a fresh start. But you can't really start over until you bring this saga to an end. Over the last few months, Ellen's reputation had been a living nightmare with many substantiated claims against her. And as she has slowly transformed into this internet caricature with not even an attempt to defend herself, it felt like she was losing grip on what she even stood for. But she still had one thing, if you're watching her show. You love me, thank and that you. means if she still had one more chance me, to redefine her values. Would she take that chance? How is everybody well, she would have to dig deep. Oh boy, welcome to season 18 of the Ellen DeGeneres Show. September the 21st, 2020, the 18th season of The Ellen DeGeneres Show was braced for release. Its journey onto the screen, although not free from obstacles, had likely led many involved to a better place. DJ Stephen Boss was also now an executive producer, so hopefully he would bring some of his signature love. And all in all, it had made those responsible more committed to a supportive structure for employees. I think we can all agree that this can be considered a broad positive. However, it was always greater than this show. It was about the person at the center. And that individual still had many devotees and detractors alike waiting for her to tackle what had cast a great shadow over her throughout this tumultuous year. In a way, this wasn't just for her, but for everyone who had looked up to her over the years, an overt renewal of a doctrine that had been taken for granted previously. This time, she had to mean it. How did she fare? Um, as you may have heard, this summer there were allegations of a toxic work environment at our show, and then there was an investigation. I learned that things happened here that never should have happened, I take that very seriously and I want to say I am so sorry to the people who were affected. I know that I'm in a position of privilege and power and I realize that with that comes responsibility and I take responsibility for what happens at my show. We have had a lot of conversations over the last few weeks about the show, our workplace and what we want for the future. We have made the necessary changes and today we are starting a new chapter. Well, the apology is quite brief in the context of the show and mostly addresses claims in their general state. As shown in the clip previously, she discusses the office environment and accepts responsibility for misconduct that occurred under her nose. In fact, this part is all executed reasonably well, with Ellen reiterating the need for a fresh start. However, we then reach the crux of a lot of people's issues, Ellen's own character, something which the TV host should know better than anyone else. And her apology slash apologia is certainly a sight to behold. There are also articles in the press and on social media that said that I am not who I appear to be on TV because I became known as the be kind lady. The truth is, I am that person that you see on TV. I am also a lot of other things. I Sometimes I get sad, I get mad, I, I get anxious, I get frustrated, I get impatient. I am a work in progress. And I'm especially working on the impatience thing because and it's not going well. In her monologue, she once more avoids specific details, opting instead to confront the general sentiment behind the allegations and the message that many within the press were using the stories to push. She calls upon her humanity and her imperfections and concedes that she isn't perfect, but is working every day to improve it. A very noble ethos indeed. She finishes by having a discussion with the new producer, Twitch, and using it as a vehicle to convey that sense of progress. Was, you know, the summer was a little crazy. It was intense, but uh, I, I, there's been a, during that time, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of learning, a lot of discussions, a lot of listening. Um, you and I have had numerous discussions, and for me, I'm just so excited to be back here in the studio so we can do what we do best, which is bring laughter, love, and fun, right? And also lead by example by putting our best foot forward after a bounce back, right? So it's all love. I'm so excited for this season. It's so, all love. Yeah. That's that's all that's real is Absolutely. love. That's the truth. After this delightful speech, Ellen moved on. I mean, she moved on to the next segment of her show, which I'll assume is hilarious comedy and trademark Ellen DeGeneres hijinks. Thank goodness it was all over. 
Yet for many people, it wasn't over. In fact, the reception on the subsequent YouTube upload was not the warmest, with the like-dislike ratios indicating a widespread rejection of Ellen's return and subsequent declamation. Most comments and video responses were tinged by a clear doubt in her integrity. After all, with such plentiful allegations, you cannot easily brush it aside in the space of five minutes with a I'm not perfect, so what narrative? I always try to grow as a person. I look at everything that comes into my life as an opportunity to learn. I got into this business to make people laugh and feel good. That's, that's my favorite thing to do. And now I am a boss of 270 people. 270 people who help make this show what it is. 270 people who I am so grateful for. All I want is for every single one of them to be happy and to be proud to work here. However, what did I think? Well, after going through the whole situation, this video struck a weird chord for sure. It is brief. The humor interspersed with these serious apologies feels a bit awkward. The laugh tracks aren't necessary and they carry on cutting back to Twitch clapping at very unprompted points like Ellen just ended racism. Ellen also talks about what's going on in the world, which, although not necessarily used as a point of defense, can feel like it's trying to detract from the allegation, which isn't what you really desire from this sort of video. At the same time, I feel like as Ellen's super fans go, they will be won over by this explanation. And to be fair, I can't exactly blame them for that. My hope is that we can still be a place of happiness and joy. I still want to be the one hour a day that people can go to escape and laugh. I want to continue to help all the people that we help every day. And I'm committed to making this the best season that we have ever had. When I spoke about the celebrity elite earlier, I mentioned how in many ways a lot of their comments were irrelevant to the charges brought against her because the greater character implications only followed from specific instance. Here, Ellen doesn't address the specific instance and that will understandably frustrate viewers. At the same time, she deals with them in a way that does umbrella the allegations and seek to explain them through the lens that the be kind narrative is obviously not always the most beneficial to her image, as it's not always something she can commit to. She is not perfect, and this seeks to tackle the underlying insinuations behind other claims. Being known as the be kind lady is a tricky position to be in. So let me give you some advice out there. If anybody's thinking of changing their title or giving yourself a nickname, do not go with the be kind lady. <laughs> Don't do it. This is where it becomes even more complicated, and I would like to reintroduce the previous explanations for her behavior, the more cynical and the more sympathetic. With commentators and critics alike, many have begun to work off the assumption that Ellen was this bad person, a tyrant who treated her employees terribly, and therefore, of course, this speech would not win them over because the only way to really undermine that rather unforgiving narrative would be if Ellen directly responded to and debunked each and every more austere allegation. That was simply not going to happen. In a way, we have been blessed by comprehensive responses from YouTubers in the past because the allegations often feel more personal to them and they want to clear themselves, but it's not something that translates across to other industries. Ellen wasn't going to release a 40-minute tell-all response to each individual claim with some ambiguous lowercase title, not if she didn't feel like she needed to. No, her responses take cues from both the other two explanations. On one hand, she clearly was out of touch, and she should be more involved in the well-being of those around her. She had become distant from what she had previously found affinity with. At the same time, she is human and will have bad days where people may not see the best side of her. I've played a straight woman in movies, so I'm a pretty good actress. <laughs> but I don't think that I'm that good that I could come out here every day for 17 years and fool you. This is me. If people were more inclined to show leniency towards Ellen, people like her supporters, then I think they may well buy this explanation. Ellen appeals to those fans when she talks about her time on the show, how they should know her. This is not directed at those who already dislike her. This is for people who are going to be responsive, who have stuck around, who have seen what Ellen has done. After all, whether people choose to forgive her or not, those who are not Ellen enthusiasts before are unlikely to become Ellen enthusiasts after. And if Ellen transformed the show into one elongated response, she would only hemorrhage more viewers. This was an appeal to people who knew her, who knew who the real Ellen was. But was it enough? Really? Who was the real Ellen?
Over the next month following the response and leading up to the time of writing the script, Ellen's show has found some semblance of stability. However, ratings have been down and that has been unsurprisingly picked up by many outlets. With the current circumstances changing the world as we know it, it's hard to tell if this is permanent, but it will certainly foster some disquietude amongst the corporate honchos. All right, Guillermo, you have to go down. All it's right. going to be good. You're going oh, down, Guillermo. All right, here we go. All right. Don't worry, Guillermo. <laughs> How was that? Terrible. Okay. <laughs> oh my God. Are we, are we done? No, you're going back up. Oh my God. God. The show itself hasn't changed too much, which has been a bit more involved in comparison to previous seasons. I guess as one of the more perceptively unproblematic individuals, his presence is a more effective instrument to win back people who may feel disillusioned with Ellen and her routine. There are still stories being published here and there about how Ellen has treated those around her, though unless there are any huge developments, I'd expect these to fade as people gradually lose interest in the topic and move on to the next badly behaving star, leaving this American idol to her own devices, rebuilding that which she may have lost before she loses far more. It's hard to believe that the plug will be pulled with the current ratings, and it's still important to remember that a bad season for Ellen is still far better than a good season for most broadcasts. At the same time, doing badly by one's own standards can still be demoralizing and there will be questions as to whether it's worth pushing on under such pretenses. As it stands, it appears that she will, but there's no real surprise behind why viewership may well be down for a program that couldn't respect its own foundation. Ellen herself took the reputational benefits that the show bestowed onto her for granted, and eventually it came back to bite her. But the burning question is, how much did she know? And what exactly did she do? What rubs a lot of people the wrong way is the hypocrisy of it. When you project this image out of the world of being kind and loving and charitable, but it turns out to all be a facade to make yourself look better when in actuality you're kind of a monster behind the scenes, that's worse than just unapologetically being an asshole. You reel people in with this fake persona and get them to fall in love with you, but you've actually been lying to their face this entire time. YouTubers and much of the press were largely unanimous in delivering their prognosis, often framing Ellen as indifferent to the suffering of those around her, even outright indulging in it. This was backed up by testimonies from people who claimed to work with her and substantial evidence that for many elaborated on on an already well-grounded perspective. However, with all this acknowledged, I feel like it was quite a selective set of evidence picked by those online. But I do agree, we shouldn't only be blaming Ellen. I would also say that Warner is probably more guilty here than what Ellen is. Oh, and of course, the other employees who also contributed in making the workspace terrible. For me personally, it's difficult to ignore the number of testimonies which actually refrained from incriminating Ellen, especially those outside the celebrity clique. The comprehensive expose from former employees stresses that Ellen was not directly aware, even though she did neglect a certain degree of responsibility. Are the stories where she's presented as a borderline psychopath incompatible with this? Not entirely, but the depiction of the workplace where Ellen is like this detached matriarch kind of makes it hard to believe that she also occupied the role of the power-hungry dictator who punishes people for her own pleasure, especially when some of her former colleagues go as far to defend her. At the same time, there were former employees who would attack her, such as ex-producer Hedda Muscat, who, working with Ellen between 2002 and 2004, had a very different idea of her awareness. She laughed and she said, every production needs their dog. Meaning like Meaning a, Ed is her dog. Like her attack dog. Her attack dog. So therefore she doesn't need to do that. He took the role of being the attack dog that she didn't have to now be the attack dog. So, so she when, didn't have to yell. So when Ellen says she's not aware of this uh, environment. You don't think that rings true? It's a lie. With all this factored in, it does become conflicting. There are so many people with different ideas of who Ellen is, especially given that many of them worked the show at the same time, and they may all have their own reasons for the positions they take, reasons that we'll never fully understand. Now, as said, there isn't a reality where these two experiences can't coexist, and the people who have advocated for it certainly makes it worthy of consideration. But by writing out people's nuanced thoughts to suit a more one-dimensional character portrait, you risk two things. First of all, downplaying the role that other actors have played, the corporation, producers, colleagues, for example, and secondly, undermining the actual experience many of the more solidified allegations seem to imply. I think that a lot of viewers had predetermined opinions which led to a lot of people becoming overly pedantic with what was really just a pretty average response to drama, even with some of these experts. Oh boy, welcome to season 18 of the Ellen DeGeneres Show. Generous Show. Generous Show. So there's a bit of a self-soothe followed by a prayer we've got a behavioral cluster although she's trying to give this jovial energetic hey it's okay let's move on she's very aware very aware about the potential downside of getting this wrong but 
why should she be bothered about it? If she hasn't done the stuff that she's been accused of, why is she praying? What? I'm sorry, but I would be 100% uncomfortable addressing allegations whether they were true or not. Telling someone that they don't have anything to worry about if they haven't done anything wrong is a good pet talk, but it's certainly not an impenetrable attack on the accused. You can make the argument that the fact that she's nervous is indicative that she clearly does care about this, and I feel to a degree she would have faced criticism however she approached the response. Or this comment which states that because she added a conditional clause, she was dismissing responsibility, despite the fact that saying if was the most logical placement in the sentence given its general. And if I've ever let someone down, if I've ever hurt their feelings, I am so sorry for that. If that's ever the case, I have let myself down and I've hurt myself as well. If you use if in these circumstances, you are not a bad person and I don't think it means that you're dismissing it. I've used it in that context before and I don't think that it's unfair to use it. It seems like so many people are trying to galaxy brain analyze her statement when it may just be a bit lackluster and contrived. In other cases, stories can be twisted, either through hyperbole for anecdotal purposes or the classic scenario of telephone. Another good example of this is the chip nail polish incident. One commenter recalled that these situations the situation in question involved Ellen phoning up the branch management and attempting to have the employee fired following it. But then the actual person who was at the center of the commotion commented saying Ellen had made a complaint which almost resulted in her being fired. Now I'm not trying to use this as a gotcha moment to prove the story as false because I don't disbelieve it one iota. But once again, it's a case of how stories can be contorted by narratives. A complaint with the intent to encourage a dismissal is very different to a complaint that almost leads to a dismissal, as one implies much more about a plaintiff's intent. Neither version of events flatters Ellen, of course. I still think it's rather daft. But the difference is still notable. This story is altered by Farah herself in an old stand-up routine. Obviously for humorous effect, and I don't think it discredits her story at all. But it's easy to see how such details are told sparingly when they don't hold too much consequence, even though with today's context, they may be decisive in understanding Ellen. And I think some testimonies did fall foul to this weakness, especially ones told from a third-party perspective. I understand self-torture because for years I worked at an organic vegan macabre restaurant serving people. Um, I too understand how it's very popular talk show host emailed the owner and complained about my chips nail polish. True story. With a lot of these stories, if you become too fixated on the role Ellen plays and not the ways that other individuals may have contributed, dickhead bosses, insensitive or coercive producers, or anyone behind the scenes who is often much less accountable but still may hold a degree of power, it's easy to lose sight of who else may have actually contributed to a situation and how they may also need to be held responsible for their actions. In some ways, Ellen had gotten away with too much for too long. At the same time, she shouldn't become a scapegoat too easily for other people's misdoings either. The whole Ellen is a sadistic psycho narrative may be more exciting, but is it the most plausible? I'll let you decide. That's a more devil's advocate argument, but now I will leave on some more assured criticism because there's more than enough to go around. Whether Ellen's genuinely mean or not, it seems there are a lot of legitimate grievances stemming from less than perfect encounters. From an outsider's perspective, Ellen allowed herself to be separated from the masses to subsequently fall out of touch with narratives that she branded herself with. We're all going to be cold and distant from time to time, and I wouldn't attack her on the basis of that. But I think it's very possible that this distance led to tone-deaf and insensitive behavior that has likely hurt a fair few people. It could equally lend itself to pedantic micromanaging and comments that rub others the wrong way. One of the saddest situations that encompasses this is Ellen's relationship with her head writer Karen Kilgriff, a previously strong and productive bond broken apart by partisan interests with Ellen just going with it. For me, if something like that happened, especially with business as it is, I would talk to them, understand their perspective. Ellen didn't have enough control of her own production or even her own character sometimes. And even if what she felt from time to time was real, the show just wasn't. It was a well-produced veneer to another rope broadcast that suffered from the same issue issues that are symptomatic of too many Hollywood creations. It needed more humanity. And maybe Ellen needs it too. This is me. The season 18 monologue wasn't the first time Ellen had spoken about her brand of kindness and the toll it can take. In the 2018 interview that I quoted earlier on in the video, she spoke about the mythical real Ellen and the weight of audience expectations on her to maintain a brand that she doesn't always identify with. The article emphasizing this, revealing that in person she's more blunt, introspective and interesting than she is on the show, willing to express mild irritation that may seem off-key in front of a national audience. Some expect her to smile all the time, be cheerful, even 
even dance, something that she stopped doing on her show a few years back because it was just too much. At the same time, even with the controversy, she's continued to pursue the kindness image, even recently launching this lovely Be Kind merchandise. She's around for too long. James Fallon, Corden. all these people, walk away. You've been famous forever. Walk away. Like, eventually, everybody, they're just going to figure it out. A lot of people close to Ellen recognized what the show had done for her public persona, but you could also observe that the show had constrained her image in a way that previous ventures hadn't, establishing standards that she couldn't live up to. Some around Ellen, her wife included, had encouraged DeGeneres to consider other avenues, yet our intrepid title character persevered. If the pre-allegation interview evinced anything, it was that the TV star saw her career path as a mixed blessing and was more aware of the perils than some may think. But it couldn't avert the inevitable tragedy. The use of this interview to promote her Netflix comedy special, Relatable, is certainly ironic in hindsight, the theme being satirical commentary on her place amongst the media elite and detachment from the hoi polloi, a concept that would rear its head in coming capers. A few years ago, I started ending my show by saying, be kind to one another. But here's the downside. I can never do anything unkind, ever. I shouldn't even have a horn in my car. Like, if someone cuts me off in a dangerous way, if I honk, they're like, Ellen? <laughs> Kindness is a virtue, not a brand, and expecting anyone to be the paragon of such a pure quality is bound to cause disappointment. At the same time, it's not wrong to expect better from someone who claimed to be better, someone who used the kindness narrative when it suited them, extending it to people who many would argue hadn't practiced it themselves, yet neglecting it with those who probably needed it more. Ellen seemed to be lost in the cosmos of her own status, and if anything, I hope the situation will pull her back down to earth. At the start of this video, I spoke about the similarities between YouTubers and talk show hosts. However, what they may share in presentation, they differ greatly in composition. And Ellen is a prime example of that. A person who, character aside, many will now see it as an algorithmically calibrated puppet maintained by a contract, rather than whatever the real Ellen is. The only person who may know who the real Ellen is, is Ellen herself. And I hope she takes the time to find out what that means. However, if she wants to reclaim her public image, then it may take more than just a monologue. It's going to take gradual healing exemplified by her own actions and I hope those who still believe in her will be rewarded in their faith. Before I knew it I had a successful sitcom and I came out and then I lost that sitcom and then I got another sitcom and I lost that sitcom too and after that I got a talk show and I was able to be myself and that was 17 years ago and I feel like you've all really gotten to know me over the past 17 years. The Ellen DeGeneres arc is certainly a fascinating one. A person who built an image from a philosophy rooted in struggle, some of which she experienced directly with her TV career, only to be accused of deserting it when she ascended the industry ranks. It's not a rare phenomenon. Plenty of people are corrupted this way, but it seemed more exceptional given her own convictions. And as a person who had been widely regarded as a national treasure, her downfall was almost awaited by those who knew the potential of such a story the twist villain per se, with content on and off YouTube attracting widespread publicity and pulling apart what had taken years to construct. Whether the damage to her image will ever be repaired is another question, and it'll depend on factors within, and likely beyond her control. Until then, the best she can do is show that she does truly care about kindness, because heaven knows we need it right now. Uh, I want to thank Olivia Munn, Ryan Gosling, Macklemore. Have a wonderful weekend. Be kind to one another. Bye. That was the video. What a great video. We had a great time recording that. I want to give big thanks to my editors. What a great set of chaps and chapesses and chaparinos. Love you all and make sure you check them out in the pinned comment as always. Big thanks to my Patreons or my patrons as, uh, as I've been informed. $10 patrons are up on screen right now, but I want to give a special personal thanks to my $50 patrons. Devon, Shiro Chigo, Amanda, Hypercube, Caroline and Sam Hullabaloo, Tree and Pokey Siren, also $50 patrons. And my $100 patron, Christopher Carras. Thank you so much for your continued support. It really does make a difference. I cannot express 
express that enough. I love you guys. My social medias will also be in the pinned comments. I don't know what else I have to add at this point. I had a great time recording this. Uh, as aforementioned, my ear was playing up, but I just stuck a headphone, a little Raycon bud in there quite deep, and that has suppressed it for now, which has allowed me to talk over it. So if you're listening to this ear, fuck you. If you're listening to this anyone else, thank you. And thank you for your continued support. Take care, guys. Bye.